This is Billy Daniel Bunter. DJ name's Billy Daniel Bunter. My real name's Daniel Light. This year is 30 years to the year that I've still not had to get a proper job. How it started for me was in the 80s. My dad introduced me to funk, electro, reggae, these albums called Street Sounds, which were very underground, hypnotic, mixed albums of either soul or funk or hip hop and electro from America. And I was just obsessed, obsessed with music beyond belief. Like that's all I cared about, music, music, music. And subsequently, my bunking off of school, going into record shops, discovering pirate radio in the 80s got me thrown out of school. I'm from a very working class background, all from Tottenham and Wood Green in North London. And in the height of the acid house scene in this country, which I believe was one of the most or is one of the most important youthful subcultures that has come out of Britain for underground music, along with mods, along with punk, along with ska. The acid house and warehouse scene of 88 and 89, for my generation, for my age group that has then been passed down over the past 30 years, is an incredibly significant subculture that has played so much influence in Garage, grime, dubstep, hardcore, hard house, jungle, everything we see and hear and the ethos of their music's come out of that era. Me and my dad and my dad's friends, and this is quite a bizarre apprenticeship, we used to go around London robbing phone boxes. So the red phone boxes that you have, that you see, I don't think people really use them anymore because we all have mobile phones. I used to go around with my dad or my uncles and we used to rob these phone boxes. We had a machine that cut the phone boxes open and the money used to come out into bags or into our hats and we'd, we'd, that's how we made our money, which is a bad way of making money, but it made us money. And one Saturday, whilst we were doing this, we passed a record shop in Whitechapel called Pools for Music. This was in 1989, so 30 years to this year. And we drove past this shop and I said, oh, Dad, a record shop. And we had all this, this money from the phone boxes and we went in and this record shop was one of the hubs of the East End illegal warehouse and pirate radio music scene. So all of the burgeoning pirate radios of the time, all of the up and coming DJs from the local area, all of the promoters, like everyone reads the stories of all these illegal raves and warehouse parties and illegal events that were happening in, in fields around the M25 and within East and North London. And this record shop was one of the hubs for that scene. So I was 14 years of age, got into this shop and my dad asked the guy who owned the shop, have you got a job for my son, mate? And the guy said, yes. He said, come back next Saturday and you can have a Saturday job. And my Saturday job was out the back filing records. Every, every Saturday I was filing records. And by being out the back, all of these, these legendary DJs of the time, like LSD, Kenny Ken, Paul Oakenfold, all of the DJs from all of the pirate radio stations like Sunrise and Centreforce, they was all coming into the shop. So at the age of 14, here I am seeing all these, the legends of the time, like all these people like 25, 30, and I'm like, that's Kenny Ken, or that's LSD, or that's the DJ from that pirate radio, and that's the DJ who runs that event. And here I am 14 years of age. And one Saturday afternoon, Dave who owned the shop, he let me go out to the front and serve people. He said, right, you ready now, come out, you can serve people. And in, in them days, the record shop buzz was incredible. Like 
records would come in, the person who was working behind the counter in the shop would play a shop full of people, all of this new music that was coming out, and the buzz was amazing. Like everyone would scream, I want that record and I want this record. And, and at the age of 14, here I was in this shop playing people all of this amazing music. And this one afternoon, one of the, one of the big events of the time was called Labyrinth. It was this event called Labyrinth and it was legendary. Its status throughout the Summer of Love of 88 and the Summer of Love 89 was, it was mythical. It was this, it was this illegal warehouse event that just had thousands and thousands of followers. Um, and it was, it was one of the buzzes of London town at that time. And the promoter of the event was stood smack bang in front of me when I was selling records. And I plucked up the courage and said, oh, mate, could I, could I come and play at one of your raves? He went, yeah. Just like I got the, record, the job in the record shop, he went, yeah, come. He was running a club in Dalston Lane up the road. And he said, uh, yeah, come next Friday and you can play a set. I was, I was 15. I'd just turned 15. And there I was at 15 years of age, just completely in what 30 years later has materialises to be one of the most important rave clubs and British underground clubs of the time, Labyrinth of Four Aces is like, is a legendary thing in amongst underground music, in, in the underground music scene. And there I was from the age of 15 to 20, every Friday and Saturday of my life, I played to 1,500, 2,000 people every weekend. And in that period, I watched the music break from Acid House to early breakbeat, to hardcore, to jungle, to drum and bass. And it wasn't till years and years later, years and years later that I started reading interviews with Slimzy and Wiley, where they said they used to come down to that club hear me DJ this really bass heavy rave music. And I, I can't MC, I can't rap or MC to save my life, but I used to pick up the mic, make some noise, put your hands in the air. And I read an interview with um, Slimzy, who said that's what inspired them to go in the studio and then want to be DJs and MCs and make grime and set up Rinse FM. I, I then found out that the original people who set up Rinse, that was where they discovered music coming down there. I've seen tweets and interviews with Chase and Status where they said the labyrinth in Dalston Lane was one of their, their biggest inspirations. It was also the place where Prodigy, obviously Keith Flint two weeks ago passed away, it was also the place where Prodigy got their first ever gig outside of their hometown and I was their warm-up DJ. Keith Flint and Liam Howlett used to come and rave to me every weekend and when I wrote my book, Liam Howlett wrote a big piece in my book about how he used to come down, listen to all this new rave and breakbeat music that we was playing. Uh, even down to massive pop acts at a time like Pet Shop Boys and Boy George, they used to come to check out this underground scene. And, and Dalston at the time, and this area was nothing like it is. I'm blown away walking into this building and seeing what's here. You wouldn't go to Dalston unless you, unless you was into underground music and didn't, didn't care about your car getting broken into or, and you wasn't scared to walk down the road at three in the morning to get into a club to hear your favourite music. You did not come to this area. And um, yeah, that was the, that was the first five years of my career every Friday and Saturday night and I had no business acrimon. I didn't want to make music. All I wanted to do was discover new music and push new music. And that was from the age of 15 to 20. And that was like the first, my first taste in music. And it was in, it was in the roughest, ruggedest club and area in London at the time. And that's what made it exciting. That's what made, and that's why still 30 years later, people still talk about that club. That's why 30 years later, I've had Sky Telly, Channel 4 have just done a documentary on me and the club, what Mix Mag, DJ Mag, all of these people, when they go back to the original hardcore jungle drum and bass scene, they always cite 
that place as an inspiration. Well, somewhere in the heart of the labyrinth, it's not the Minotaur, but no, it's DJ Manic and DJ Yankee, who, uh, though they're not working tonight, are kind of definitely associated with the labyrinth sound. Tell me, how long have you been playing and coming to this place? Because it's been going for seven years now. I've been coming to this place for about the last three years, been playing for here for the last one half to two years. Yeah. Okay. How did you break in? Were you a kind of punter that got keen for the deck? I pestered the management. There's a, t there's a tip for up and coming DJs, pester the management. And I believe the reason why it was such a buzz is because it was dangerous. It, it was so makeshift. People like me as the main DJs or the promote, like the promoter was an old football hooligan. I was this young working, well, I wasn't even working class. I was 15, I got thrown out of school and it was dangerous and there was a vibe and there was an energy and there was an attitude. And I was very fortunate to be part and at the right age of having this love for music in this explosive creative time. And that, that was basically the first five years of my career and I had no I had no need to want to make music because in that time DJs DJed, promoters promoted and producers made the records. Like a recording studio then would be like 20, 30 grand to even get yourself going. And it was all of this stuff was so out of reach. So music now and dance music is all very DJ friendly and when I started, music wasn't DJ friendly because the DJs wasn't making it. It was producers and they was creative. And how I found myself becoming a producer was completely by chance, much like finding myself in a record shop, finding myself with one of the most important residences in hardcore and jungle and breakbeat music was again by chance. And now as I get older, these I realise these things weren't really about chance. They were the fact that I had passion in the in in certain moments and, and people who I'd begun to work with picked up on my passion. I was me and my partner Sonia, we was having um, pie and mash in um, East Ham and this big ragger guy comes up to me screaming and shouting through the pie and mash window, it's you, it's you, it's you. And I thought I'd done something wrong. I thought, like, who have I upset now? Like, who, who is this guy, like, screaming and shouting at me through this shop window, through this restaurant window? And he's come in and he's going, you're, you're that geezer from Labyrinth. Like, everyone's talking about your style. Like, Labyrinth's rammed every week. You're, like, I played really uplifting vocal music, like, really hands-in-the-air music. Like, at the time, there was AWOL, which was Kenny Ken, Mickey Finn, Darren J, Randall. They was over in Islington all playing really cutting-edge drum and bass instrumental music. And then I was in Dalston playing this more uplifting, hands-in-the-air, vocal-led music. And this guy, Oller, he run a label called Just Another Label. He was, he was like, you've got to come in the studio. You've got to come in the studio. And I had no desire ever to make music. And reluctantly, I, I said, yeah, all right, mate, I'll, I'll come in the studio. So I've gone into the studio on my first ever session. And I did not have a clue what I was doing. Like, I was, I was plonked in the, the studio with, with Optical, from Ed Rush and Optical. He, he, Matt become massive as Optical. At the time, he wasn't Optical, but I made my first... No, he made my first tune and I just sat there going, I just want people to put their hands in the air and make it really like uplifting for me, mate. And I want the bass heavier. And we made this tune. I invited some friends called JDS to help me. They'd been making some tunes that I was playing out. And the first record I made called Let It Lift You got played five times at World Dance to 20,000 people in one night. And I went from not having the buzz to making music to having the same buzz for making music that I had for DJing. So all of a sudden I then found myself in a studio all the time learning about production, learning about producing music, learning about pushing music forward through being in the studio and, and the bug caught me. And all of a sudden people just started finding me because these records were right, the vibe was right. And out of no, it felt like almost overnight, I went from 
this underground London status to never want to make it to make records to finding myself all over the UK on all of these flyers at like the age of 20, 21. And it was just like this whirlwind. And like I'd never had any business acrimony to even think I could make money out of DJ. And I never had a business plan to to make all of these records or get on these flyers. It was just it was just a series of this is my buzz. This is my energy. I didn't care about a business plan. I didn't care about money. I didn't care about any. I just cared about music. And it seemed that everywhere that I went, everything I did, my music would just take me to naturally where I had to get to. My thing is my energy, like my energy for 30 years through ups and downs has just kept me continually in this thing. And in my very early days, in my early 20s, I had so much energy, I would go from label to label making music for people. And I would give my music away. I'd be like, yeah, I wouldn't even sign contracts. I'd be like, yeah, take that onto the next label, onto the next. I was just in this energy all the time. And everyone around me was like, what are you doing giving your music away? What? No, it doesn't matter. I just give everyone my music. Like, my energy and my passion and my love meant more than all of this other stuff. As time went on, and I, and I guess really a lot of... DJs and a lot of people who come through the underground scene that was being run by foot hooligans and gangsters and there was no business plan. There was no business plan for, for us back then. As time went on, come the late 90s, when I'd gone from like, I was getting into my mid-20s, I then started looking around thinking, I've got to stop giving my music away. I've got to stop giving my energy away. I need to have my own labels. I need to own my own music. We had a recordings label called um, Honeypot Recordings that in the year 2001, unbeknown to me, held the biggest market share for an independent record label of the year 2001. M me and Sonia run this re recordings label out of our two bedroom council flat with our son running around because we'd left my mum's house by then. And we had this record label that we had no idea was breaking lower top 40, top 50, getting in all of these charts. And I, I was still running it like a, like a, like it was white labels. And our distributor insisted we had barcodes on these records to get it in HMV and all this stuff. And we had this, we had this record label and it was massive and it was turning over hundreds of thousands of pounds and me and Sonia had no clue of the VAT man. We had no clue of the tax man. We had no clue of MCPS. We had no clue of, of contracts and legal side. It was just me doing what I'd always done since I was 15, music. Got to have music, got to have this buzz. Like I've got to sign my friends and I would give my artist share to my friends. I, and like, I had no clue of the, that all of this money that was coming in, a whole bag of it was the VAT man's, a whole bag of it was the tax man's and all of this stuff. And we had this massively successful record label that actually the success of it at the time felt like it was the biggest hindrance of our life, having the VAT man at the door, having these massive tax bills, having arguments with friends, having publishers tell us that I'm ripping my own self off. And it, it, it was like, it was this massive learning curve that on the front of it, everyone thought, wow, like you lot have got the biggest market share. How is your underground label getting top 50? And we didn't even know half the time. Like I tell you, how we found out was Sony, Sony Records faxed me, like we had faxes, that, that, that was when faxes were happening. And Sony Records, I was gonna do a deal with Sony Records to do a mix album and and the governor at Sony messaged me saying, congratulations on your top 40, Dan. I'm thinking, top 40? We're not releasing any pop records. And I've gone and looked at this chart and because we've the, the record was so popular and every, all the HMVs had been barcoding it up, that's when, it got into the chart, we'd sold tens of thousands of copies and I had no idea what MCPS was. And MCPS hit me, hit me and Sonia with like a 150, 200 grand bill. We never, we lived in a two bedroom flat. Like we had no idea like what MCPS was. And what they'd done was, 
I owned, these records were by Billy Daniel Bunter or whoever I was producing them with. My name's Daniel Light, so on all of the publishing credits, my name would go down. And they quantified that every record I was releasing was selling like 30, 40,000 copies. So they hit me with this massive bill that I owed them this money that they then had, to, my label owed them this money that they then had to pay back to me. So it was a massive, massive learning curve about the legality sides of the music industry, along with the VAT at the time, along with the tax man. We, our success found us in the deep end, which taught us an incredible lesson. At that same time, it became inevitable. And this happened, this happened a lot with people like me, with DJs like me who'd come through the illegal underground pirate scene or the illegal rave scene. And many of us had enough of playing for gangster promoters. Many of us had enough of going around the country and getting, let's say, get, taking six hours to drive to Newcastle. You think when you're that young and someone rings up and says, come Newcastle and play, boom, 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 here's, here's how much we'll give you. When you're 18 or 19 or 20, yeah, mate, I'll come and do it. And you find a mate to drive you up to Newcastle, you get there, you play to loads of people and then the promoter's nowhere to be seen. And like your six hours up north and then it takes six hours to drive back and that that happened a lot as well as all the good stuff you'd have loads of dodgy promoters back then and um the inevitable happened with people like me that once we'd learned to master the art of our dj and being a business once we'd had many behind the scenes failures with record labels and learnt about the legal side and the financial side and stuff like that. It was inevitable that we'd then become promoters. Like we we don't want to play for all of these gangsters and football hooligans and fly by nights who are taking our names and our music and trying to promote us to sell their clubs and stuff like that. And then we get there and they knock us or they're not doing right by, by our music or the artists on our label. So we went into um, promoting events and I always said I would never promote a, events. This was, this was some 24, 24 years ago. I said I would never ever promote events. Promoting is an absolute mugs game. And lo and behold, 24 years later, I'm still that mug putting on events as well as DJ and as well as running record labels. And we went into the business of promoting events as well as having our record label and we've done everything we've sold out ministry of sound we've sold out electric in brixton we've take we've hired out clubs up and down the country we take thousands of people abroad to our events we've done tours all over the world and once again like with the running the record label we threw ourselves in at the deep end with promoting events and getting getting people to come to clubs like the live events and putting on events is the most unforgiving side of the music industry because you're relying on people to come to your event, break you even, but with, without the live side, you don't promote the artists on your label, you don't promote your new releases. And without promoting, Sonia's run our event in Brixton and been held up at gunpoint for money. I've upset other promoters along the way and I've had people sat outside my house with guns wanting to shoot me. And so in my life, I've had the VAT man, the tax man, gangs trying to hold up my club and other promoters who think that I've upset them or taken their crowd wanting to stop me doing it. And in all of that time, my passion and love for music, no one's ever stopped me. Like I've always overcome. So we had to learn about that. We had to learn about tax. We had to learn about MCPS. I had to learn how to talk my way out of situations of other promoters wanting to, to stop us from doing our thing. And music is such a massive buzz. Music gives us all energy when we make music in a studio, when we put on an event, when we go out DJ and when we play live, like music gives us all that, that you, music gives us such an energy. So when you're all making music, you all feel an energy, don't you? Like that's that creative buzz is such a special thing. And sometimes there can be so many pitfalls and downfalls at the opposite end of that energy that you feel. And the biggest thing that I've learned and only experience will get you all to this point is that 
in fact, all of the pitfalls, all of them troubles that you face, whether it's no one picking up on your record or no one turning up to your event or people walking off of the dance floor because you might have put the wrong record on or you thinking you've made an absolute banger and no DJ's picking up on it and all of these things that disappoint you and get you down or you might not be able to get your beeline right on your latest tune and you scratch your head like all of those pitfalls are actually as important as when you find that energy because if you don't go through them pitfalls if you you know being held up at gunpoint is a massive extreme to some of the things that you'll find but one of the most important things that you can all do is embrace the down points because the down points are what makes your creativity worth every bit makes it worth every last drop of energy that you have if you can overcome every pitfall like in the height of our vat tax mcps rival promoters people holding up our raves for for our door takings because of our bad management because of our bad um legal knowledge we almost went bust um and at, and at that point it felt like the end of the world but now it's like the biggest learning curve i could have ever ever had because every failing that we made that was going to end us and put us under now in this part of my life are all lessons that i actually look at wow what a blessing that i learned all that stuff after that um honeypot recordings experience and the gangsters try to take over our events, the VAT man, us having to give all the money that we thought was ours to the VAT man. All of this series of stuff led me to Ministry of Sound. Um, out of nowhere, Ministry of Sound, the, one of the biggest um, record labels for dance music of all time, phoned me and said, There's, we want you to mix an album. And we really needed money. Like We had lots of debts and all of this stuff. This was like 2001, no, this was 2005. So I'd been DJing for like 15 years on the verge of bankruptcy, even though on, on the face of it all, I was still headlining all these events, playing everywhere. My records were, I still was making lots of records, but behind the scenes, we was a mess. We couldn't control our legal or financial side. And there was this big, 15 years is a long time in music, right? And there was this big old school, resurgence of like all the music that I played when I was younger started becoming a thing, started becoming big. So not only was I making new breaks music, new hard house, new hardcore music, there was also this massive vibe for like what happened in the early days of British dance music, what happened in the early days. And Ministry picked up on this and they phoned me up and said, we want you to mix an album of all your old set of what you used to do. So I f all I saw was pound signs. All I saw was this debt that I was in and I was like, right, yep. And I got a little advance and I got advances for my music and it, it dug us out of a bit of a hole in a really bad time. And I thought this album would sell 20,000 copies and that would be it. Because what happens with a label like Ministry and underground DJs is you get a chance to mix one album if it flops, you're dropped and they're not going to put any more money into you. And um, this album went, and went number one in HMV, Tesco's, I think even Woolworths was still going at the time. This album was massive. It sold like 150,000 copies in like its first month, which for an underground album was incredible. And all of a sudden I found myself with Ministry for five years, and we sold over a million albums. When you're in music, your energy finds you in these places, your natural love for music finds you in places. And halfway through the whole Ministry deal, it suddenly dawned on me that I was nearly 20 years into my career, and I wasn't 15 anymore, I was like 35 years of age. I'd been through all of this stuff. And Ministry used to get me to, talk to their marketing team about all the ideas that were in my head about marketing and they'd come to me with track lists and and all of the, these years of experience and knowledge just all come together in this in this major album deal and the mad thing 
is earlier I was saying about how I used to give all of my music away and let people sign me without really signing. It was always verbal agreements and always, yeah, I don't care about sod the contract, sod the money, get my tune out, boom, boom, boom. And a lot of people used to advise me not to do that, but something in me always felt right about doing I'm not advising any of you to do it like that, but everything I ever did always felt right. So when the Ministry Old School albums come about, all of the music that I give away, I then went and took back off of all the labels, right, I'm having that back, I'm having, and, and you know, this is mine. And all of my energy and hard work from 15 years previous come to light 15 years later. Even though in the moment it was massive for me, but years later I got rewarded. And that was another, that was another massive, massive learning curve for me in that, I realised that once again, how important your energy and self-belief is because you never know when it's going to reward you. You never know when a film's going to come in and license a piece of your music. You never know when an artist you made a record with 10 years ago, that record might get sampled and, and blow up as another tune in another genre. You don't know when all of your energy, because like, Creative energy is an amazing thing. Like it might only last for a day in the studio or half hour in the studio, but at some point in time, if you keep on, if you keep on every time you've got energy, every time you've got a buzz, every time someone inspires you, you might want to sign or something you want to do, gives you that creative buzz. At one point in your life, as long as you keep sticking it out, as long as you overcome every hurdle, every let down, one day your energy will reward you. And that's been the biggest thing that I've learned in my career, that every time I have a buzz or an energy or a creative flow, it might not reward me straight away. All good things come to an end. Our Ministry of Sound fizzled out and I thank my lucky stars that I had five years out of something that I thought was going to give me one album and pay some debts off that I had. Ministry got signed to Sony. There was no real call for underground albums. You know, they, they went lots and lots of commercial albums, the best of this music, the best of that. And it was pretty much, when that ended, I was pretty much 25, 23 to 25 years into my career. Like, literally, from the age of 15 to that point had flown by all of these ups, all of these downs, all of these mad series of, of events just flew by and it, it, it suddenly dawned on me that I'm not far off from my 40s and like I've done this like my entire life without ever stopping, no one's ever stopped me, I've never like dropped out of this thing. I've always like believed in my music. I've always believed in bringing people through. I've always believed in enriching everyone around me. And um, I realized the significance of the era that I was discovered in. I realized the significance of the subculture that I had been fortunate to be a part of in its infancy. I realized that like I was part of something that is as important as punk and mods and all of the other things that had gone before it. And I found this new passion that I wanted to write books. I wanted to release books. I wanted to put on art galleries. I wanted to do seminars. I wanted to release records again. No one had released records for like 10 years. Like records had become obsolete and I wanted to release records again. And, and it was all aimed at my age group. Realized that there's a whole bag of like-minded people like me who still want to buy records and they want to read about this stuff. And then I started thinking to myself, if I start writing and releasing books, that means in like a hundred years, 200 years, a thousand years, someone somewhere will learn about my piece of history that happened in this area in 89, 90, 91, 92, 93. And I, I want the world to know how significant that is to me and my generation. And so just like in 91, 92, when I was playing all the new breakbeat music that was coming out, just like in 94, 96, when I was playing the new happy hardcore, just like in the late 90s, early 2000s, all the new hard dance, just like the bright, just like everything I'd ever been through. And I'd put my heart and soul and, passion into believing into this stuff, I then started 
thinking like that with the history. I want, I want the world to know the history of my friends, uh, me, like everyone who I love, all of the music that I believe in. This stuff deserves to be out there forever. And when I, when I put the first book out, Oxford University, Cambridge University, they all requested copies of the books. There's been documentaries about dance music on Sky, upcoming stuff on Netflix and Channel 4, and they all get the six books that I've released and use them as like real pointers. And everything has always been driven by passion, like everything. Like I've all, I always said, like my biggest failings, my, my biggest failings is, is when I've had money success, is when I've put money first. They, they have always been my most uncreative, biggest failings whatsoever. Whenever I've put what matters to me the most, which is music and the history of music, that's when I've had my biggest success. That is always when I've had my biggest success. Like, when I don't care, like, of course, in the early days, I didn't care about paperwork. I didn't care about accounting and all that. I did not care. Now I have to care because I realise that I'm not 25 anymore and I don't want to keep going through what I did in my 20s. But now, I realise the importance of the, the passion and the creative process, but I also realise the importance of all of my knocks and all of the hardships I've been through. Because when you combine the two, that's when you'll be here for 30 years like I've been. I've never stopped for 30 years.